Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of The Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian perspective on what's going on in the world. And I'm joined, as I am every week, by Richard Ebeling, the BBNT Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. It's good to be with you and our viewers and listeners, as always. A pleasure. And to be able to wish them a very soon Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, Richard, okay, big news. President Trump is threatening to close down the government if he doesn't get his much be uh, beloved Berlin Wall. I mean, that, he doesn't call it that, but that's really what it is. And he's he's been dreaming of this wall maybe even before he became president. He he said that he was going to make the Mexicans pay for it, but now all of a sudden he's... he's hell-bent on making the American taxpayers pay for it. And so he's telling Congress that if you don't give me the funding for my beloved wall here, that I'm going to shut down the government. So, I mean, there's two things we could talk about, the, the wall and the shutting down, but I thought we would kind of orient toward the shutting down of the government because it's such a joke. I mean, how many times have we gone down this road, Richard, where, oh, the government is supposedly shut down, and all the non-essential workers go down. I, I think that it's illegal to call them non-essential now because at one time when they called them non-essential, they all had to go into therapy. Uh, they were so depressed at being considered non-essential employees, so they had to, to change the name. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's, here's the real joke of this thing. It really is just a paid vacation. That's why nobody cares. And in fact, my hunch is that the, the bureaucrats in Washington are looking forward to it. It's a paid vacation. Because what always happens after the shutdown is that they get their back pay. So, yes. so, so they end up getting paid for doing nothing, which really might be a better thing for us. I mean, the ideal thing for us is to shut down permanently all the non-essential functions of government, lay off all those bureaucrats, put them in the private sector. Um, but the second best thing, if, you, if you're going to have these non-essential <coughs> agencies and departments, you're better off with them doing nothing. Because the way I figured is that when they're doing something, that means they're doing something harmful. And so the the best is lay them off. The second best is if you got to be paying them, hope that they don't do anything because they're going to be doing something harmful. Uh, so I mean, you know, maybe maybe in a in an imperfect world, this is the better alternative where where you just send them home. You're still having to pay them, still having to raise taxes um, or print the money to pay them, but at least you're not doing harm. What do you think about this whole charade? Well, I think it's sort of like the irritating relative who has been living with you for a long time. And finally, since you're having to give him room and board and pocket money anyway, why don't you just pay him to go away? At least it's still costing you the same amount of money, but he's not irritating you under your household. So in my opinion, it's like, it's, it's like an extortion racket. You pay the guy not to bust up your business. So fine. If we pay them their salaries while they're furloughed like this, at least for every day that they're not sitting at their desk, as you were suggesting, they're not regulating, snooping, controlling, manipulating, irritating, doing something to make our lives less comfortable and, and, and less profitable. So as far as I'm concerned, this is great. But of course, this is all a sham, as you were also saying. Not only that the government doesn't go away, because notice how they express it. And what you're saying is, perhaps the politically incorrect phraseology, you know, non-essential personnel. Though I have to say that after the, 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 the shutdown in the 1990s, there was a political cartoon that I loved. It was a government building with a huge banner in front of it, welcome back non-essential personnel. That makes you feel good. <laughs> so what the thing is, is that the, the, the Congress has passed a huge amount of, of the tax bills and the appropriations for the coming or the current 2019 federal government fiscal year, which began on October 1. So at the most, at least as some of the commentators that I've read have said, it's going to be one fourth of the government. The, 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 the military is staying there because by golly, we have to protect America. 
Uh, the, the FBI is still there. Uh, the IRS is still there. All of these agencies that are the most the most likely to irritate us, you know, this, with surveillancing, snooping, regulating, controlling, taxing, they don't go away. Uh, so this is just a sham thing. Now, what may be done, as has happened in the past, well, I guess we're going to have to shut down the Washington Monument. I guess we're not going to allow access into the Grand Canyon. But it's Christmas week. Who the hell would be going on a vacation to the Washington Monument, to the Grand Canyon anyway? So they're going to all, everybody who would be irritated, oh, they shut down the Lincoln Memorial. They're going to be with their relatives anyway. So it's even more of a sham. So th th this is just you know smoke and mirrors and 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 stage uh, effect uh, for for and pablum for the masses, uh, and this all came about because I'm sure many of our viewers and listeners might have seen that news clip when President Trump was recently in the Oval Office with with with, with the two Democratic leaders, uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, I try to forget his name. What is his name? Schumer. Schumer, thank you. And they got into the into, into the shouting match. And then finally Trump says, I proudly take the shutdown as mine because security is more important than a shutdown. And the Republic and the Democrats say, Yes, yes. And Pelosi comes out, you see, it's just it's just a, a, an issue of his manliness, manliness, because you know he's concerned concerned with having something built that's huge, huge. De Wait a minute. It would be along the Texas Mexican border, right? Isn't Rio Grande? Does that mean big anyway? It's huge. So I guess maybe she's right. But anyway, so this is all a sham, smoke screens. It's it's good 15 second news bites on the evening news. But the fact is, the government remains in place, doing the things that are non-essential, in far in my opinion. And how do I find define non-essential? Nothing that is not a federally designated and assigned function in the original Constitution, which means non-essential, in my humble opinion, is at a minimum 90% of what the federal government does today. So this is, this is nonsense and it's just show. Yeah, you raise a very interesting point though that, that really distinguishes libertarians from the rest of society, for, well, from conservatives and liberals. And, and that is that what is non-essential? What does that really mean? And, yes. and, and even in the context of this joke and this sham, I think it's an important issue to explore. Absolutely. And and because, as you point out, a lot of these functions are going to continue, even though the government is, quote, shut down. I read right. that every federal official that carries a gun automatically stays on the job. I mean, so that means the DEA continues staying on the job. That means uh, the immigration service, the border patrol, stays on the job, yes. uh, and and um, a lot of these other people who, who are carrying guns as part of their job. Now, that that raises the issue of what is the legitimate role of government in society? Should there be a DEA? I mean, you and I would consider this totally non-essential, and yet in the world of conservatism and liberalism. That's an absolutely essential thing, to punish people for ingesting bad substances. Now, let's just concede for argument's sake that illicit drugs, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, opioids are harmful to a person. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is any of the government's business. I mean, yeah. booze is harmful to a person. It can be. Yeah. Cigarette smoking is, can be harmful to a person. <clears throat> but I don't know of very many people that want to put people in jail for doing these things. Um, so why is it that the government's doing this? So, I mean, we, we would just shut, this down, shut that thing down. You, you look at the whole welfare state bureaucracy. Uh, I mean, the idea, this, this idea that government needs to force people to be good and caring. Uh, and so by, by the force of government. So the government seizes money through the IRS, a large quantity of money uh, from people who are struggling to make a living, they're trying to make ends meet, they don't have enough money for vacation, and the government's just seizing you know, 20 to 30% of their income and giving it to someone else and saying, this shows what a good person you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we talked about that in the last show about mandatory charity, but 
I mean, from a libertarian standpoint, this is non-essential. So we would just shut down every single welfare state agency, department. We'd privatize the bureaucrats. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the huge military-industrial complex or deep state or national security state, whatever label you want to put on this giant monstrosity of a permanent, ever-growing military establishment, intelligence establishment, CIA, NSA, surveillance, torture, foreign bases, foreign interventions. I mean, what do you need all the foreign bases for? Uh, I mean, you know, how would how would Americans react if a foreign country said we're going to establish we want to establish military bases in your country? I mean, nobody liked that. So why is the U.S. having all these bases all over the world? Why are they intervening? Well, here's another example: foreign aid. Well, that's just welfare for dictators and welfare for democratic regimes. You know, they they usually line their pockets with it. This mm-hmm. notion that the money gets to the poor is such nonsense. It's so it's a bribe to foreign regimes to vote our way at the United Nations and do what we want when we some, want something in international affairs. Well, when we start talking as libertarians about shutting down the non-essential functions of government, we're talking about a massive reduction in the role of the federal government in our lives, Richard. Mm-hmm. Well, you're absolutely right, and as you're saying, the the agencies that have the power to intrude. Uh, uh, through surveillance into our lives will not disappear. The Department of Homeland Security, the National Security Agency. In fact, shortly after the national, the Homeland Department, Homeland Security Department was established, there was a again a political cartoon that was out in one of the uh, publications around this time of the year, and it had a bunch of NSA people looking at their computer screens, obviously surveillancing people, and they were all singing, we know when you are sleeping, we know when you're awake, we know if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And behind them is a Santa Claus with a gun strapped to his waist. (laughs) So, I mean, now, the fact is, uh, you know, it shows how desensitized we become, Jacob. Uh, At that time, the idea was to have political cartoons like that, that are humorous, but is winding, wind, reminding us of the idea of a government that has the technological capacity, and particularly with its, uh, the, the, its intrusions in and attempts to influence uh, social media networks and platforms that really, for private commercial reasons, accumulate a lot of uh, data about us, to sell for advertising purposes, so the rest of the things that we use them for are often free. They now access that data, so besides their own source of information, uh, they they, they impose, if you will, uh, industrial policy, government business partnerships on these uh, social media private sector uh, companies. And through this, there's very little that they don't know about us, or if they want to, can find out about us. But we have become so, so desensitized would anyone even think of running a cartoon like that that was considered timely and, and poignant in, let's say, 2002? And, and this is another danger that when government becomes this large and has persisted in its in its size and its intrusiveness uh, for, for such a long period of time, we become desensitized. We start taking it for granted. And we forget that there could be a time, and there was a time, uh, when government was a lot smaller and did essential functions. As classical liberals, as libertarians, I certainly believe that there needs to be some agencies to protect this from crime, murder, abuse, fraud. There can be historically instances of foreign invaders attempting to attack your country and subjugate you and plunder your land. Uh, but, but government has gone far beyond any of those rational and reasonable uh, duties and responsibility of a limited government. And most people don't even think about it anymore because they just look around and they see it and it's for taking as granted as much as I'm looking out my window, the sky is blue or here in South Carolina, the leaves really haven't changed very much and most of them are green. You, you just look around, that's the given. We, we, we never, never even think of saying, well, is the sky blue or why or why are leaves green in the scientific sense? We just take it for granted and never challenge its existence. And that is what we've done with most of government. Yeah, yeah that's a very interesting point, is is what what does it mean to be free? 
And and I, I think most people don't ask that question. They just naturally assume they're free. You know, they, they thank the troops for their freedom. Now, when you're thanking somebody for your freedom, that means you honestly believe you're free. And 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 yet here we we live in a society that's quite dysfunctional. I mean, you, you've got increasing suicide rates, uh, including among young people that are just taking their lives early. They're just checking out. You've got massive drug addiction, uh, enough to justify this ongoing decades-long drug war. You've got massive alcoholism. Um, in other words, you've got characteristic oh, mass unexplained killings. These, these shootings where people just going off the deep end and killing people for no explainable reason. Um, and, and these are characteristics not of a free society. They're characteristics of things that you'd find in a totalitarian socialist society, like in the Soviet Union, where there was massive alcoholism. And, and I think that's what happens. And I, I think there's, there's two problems that, that are facing our country. One is that you've got this massive combination socialist regulatory militarist system that is just squeezing the life spirit out of the American people. It's like a giant screw or set of screws that they just keep tightening year after year after year. And and and, and that creates a lot of despair and despondency and the, the, the cost to fund this entire machinery is exorbitant. So people you know, look at their paychecks and they, they see the FICA and the, and the withholding and, they, and they, they just they, they say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I can't do it. I can't make ends meet anymore and so forth. But all the while they're thinking, I live in a free country, I live in a free country. And that's the flip side of the problem here is that people have convinced themselves or the government has convinced them primarily in public schooling from the first grade on up that this is all freedom. And, and so I think what happens is, I think any psychiatrist will tell you, that when you believe something to be true and you're convinced it's true, and it's not, it's not reality, it develops a psychosis within you. You're just denying reality. You know, my favorite quote, I think, of all time is, is Johann Goethe, where he, this quote really sums up the plight of our fellow Americans. Goethe said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Uh, I mean, so if Americans understood, as we libertarians understood, that a welfare warfare state way of life is not freedom, they might choose it anyway. They might say, okay, well, I want to be taken care of by the government. I, I like the being a ward of the state. I like being dependent on the government. Fine. Uh, that's different from a person that says, oh, I am so grateful that the welfare warfare state has brought me freedom. You know, it, it's sort of like serving Caesar and saying, Caesar, Caesar, I never knew freedom till I came to serve you. Um, now, if, if you look at, at, for example, America's founding principles, we know that those Americans define freedom as something different. Uh, now, we, we have exceptions. We have slavery. We have tariffs. Women didn't have the right to vote. We all know that. But we set those aside and we look at these other principles that were embraced throughout the 19th century that were defined as freedom for a group of people there, American citizens, white citizens. Uh, no income tax. They were free to keep everything they earned. No Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, foreign aid to dictators, or any other welfare. Uh, There's no welfare state. You kept everything you made. You decided what to do with it. All charity was voluntary. There was no Federal Reserve. Uh, there was a gold and silver coin standard, no paper money. Uh, there was no standing army, m great big military industrial complex, no foreign military bases, no foreign wars, at least in, a in, in Africa, Europe, Asia. Uh, no CIA, no NSA, and this no drug war, no immigration controls. This is a remarkable society. It's totally different from the kind of society we live in today. And those Americans throughout the 1800s defined that as freedom. That's what they were celebrating when they would celebrate the 4th of July. That is a, a way of life that's totally opposite from the way of life we live, Richard. And so you, you, you have to ask yourself, is all of this dysfunctionality in American society, one, because we abandoned those founding principles, and two, because all too many Americans just cannot bring themselves to acknowledge that abandonment. 
Well, I think that your your idea of uh, people's in the normal sense of what we mean by addictions, alcohol, drugs, um, psychological depressions, and perhaps this has to do with an institutional setting of the interventionist welfare state that has made life seem less possible, fewer opportunities, more fatalistic. But if I can just complement that with another notion of addiction, and that is so many people in our society who are addicted to the government redistributive programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, government subsidization of the education of their children from K through even a PhD, depending upon the uh, 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 applicability of a grant or loan. Uh, let's take the recent court decision in Texas, just what, what was it last week, where uh, a judge declared that because Congress had repealed the mandatory premium payment under Obamacare, that this makes logically all of Obamacare unconstitutional. Now, separate from that issue and the grounds in which he argued it, let's think about the response by many of the social critics, by which I mean those who are the ideological fosterers of such welfare statist addiction. And this is for a program, Obamacare, that has been in effect for less than 10 years, okay? And what is the psychology? How will people get by if they don't have their government guaranteed health care program under Obamacare? What will happen to their preconditions? What happens if their little son Johnny gets sick and Johnny is little and 25 years old? And, 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 see this I mentality, how can I get by if the government doesn't take care of me? This was captured in a government prepared and posted cartoon during the Obama years called The Life of Julia. Now, when I first saw this on YouTube, I thought it was a satire, because how else could you think of it if you think rationally? But this was the government under the Obama administration. Here's Julia as a little girl. Governments paid for the medical expenses for her birth in the hospital. Here's Julia's mommy going to work without a husband in the household. So the government is paying for daycare so mommy can work. Here's Julia going to college and without government financial support and anti-discrimination was, how could Julia ever get a degree? Here's Julia in the workplace. And again, here's government laws and commands and prohibitions assuring that she gets a fair shake. And here's Julia retiring and social security is assuring that she has a comfortable and secure period of the later years of her life. Now think about this. Is that not a cartoon version of that phrase from the cradle to the grave? Here is the government itself saying, do not think of a life without the government holding your hand with you as a perpetual child and we as the parent taking you through your entire life, assuring that you get what we've decided you deserve. That's the addiction of too many of our fellow Americans. I totally agree with you. And, and what they've done is, in the process of having this welfare warfare state, they've really damaged people's sense of self-esteem, their belief in themselves, the belief in, in a free market, and a belief in freedom. So you have this, this strange situation where people are convinced they're free, but yet, on the other hand, are terrified of genuine freedom. Uh, you can see it like in the drug war, that when we libertarians say, look, it's time to get rid of this debacle of a government program. It's brutal. It's inhumane. It's corrupt. It doesn't even accomplish what it purports to want to accomplish. And just legalize all drugs, not just marijuana, cocaine, heroin, a free market in drugs. Oh my gosh, if we did that, everybody would go on drugs tomorrow. Airline pilots, brain surgeons, everybody be toked up in the very next day. See, they, they have no faith in freedom, except for them. It's, uh, uh, you know, whenever you say, well, would you, would you be one of those ones that are out there taking heroin tomorrow? Well, no, I wouldn't, but everyone else would. We can't do that. 
You see, because the idea of a free society terrifies him. So they're willing to live under this tyranny of a corrupt debacle of a program uh, that accomplishes nothing. In fact, it makes things worse with all the violence that it engenders and the corruption and luring people into the drug trade that ordinarily would never get involved in that but because of the high profits to be made. And, and you see it in the welfare state. Oh my gosh, as you point out, if we abolished Obamacare and Medicare and Medicaid, the poor would be dying in the streets. Well, you see, there's no faith and freedom there. I mean, in order to, to really have a free society, you got to have a society of people who believe in freedom, uh, that, that you can trust the free market, that without government intervention, medical prices would be very reasonably priced. Uh, and, and then there's also the, the charity angle where doctors who would be making a fortune would be willing to help out the poor instead of the cynicism that exists today or even the inability because of the exorbitant rising prices that Medicare and Medicaid and Obamacare have, have brought to our society. Social Security is another classic example. Oh my gosh, I could never live without Social Security. Well, yeah, you could. Uh, there's very few people that cannot manage. I mean, okay, there's somebody you know dying in the cancer wards, but charity always comes through and helps those kind of people. That's what faith and freedom is. It's, it's a faith in, in belief in others that people will come through to help out those that are genuinely in need. But, but you know, God has created resilient human beings. Without Social Security, it might be that some people might have to go back to work. But there's nothing wrong with that. Somebody 72 working at Walmart or whatever. I mean, I, 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 over the weekend I saw this movie with Clint Eastwood uh, where he's playing a drug mule. True story. And the guy is, Clint Eastwood's 88 years old. And he's, he's out there, you know, obviously having the time of his life, still working. Well, there's a lot of people into their 70s, at the very least, that could still continue working, staying in the mainstream of life, uh, interacting with younger people in the workplace and so forth, and uh, don't necessarily have to be living off this dole. And then, of course, there's a lot of wealthy people that don't even need the money. So what we have to do, Richard, is we have to reinvigorate people with this faith in freedom, both faith in themselves, faith in others. Same with the military. You know, as you pointed out, the legitimate role of government is to protect us from an invasion and then to protect us from murderers and rapists and thieves and the like. Well, state officials can handle those crimes. You don't need to have the federal government involved in murder cases or rape cases. So the federal government, its legitimate functions are very few. You've got a federal judiciary in case there's federal cases, judicial cases, but there is no possibility, none, that any foreign nation is going to invade the United States. They, they don't have the capability. They don't have the money. They don't have the troops. They don't have the supply lines. They don't even have the interest of crossing the oceans to invade the United States. But, man, when you mentioned to Americans about let's get rid of the CIA, the NSA, the huge military-industrial complex, let's just keep a basic military force just in the event the day ever arises that somebody's going to invade the United States, everybody has a conniption fit. Scared to death. Oh, my gosh, the, the terrorists will come and get us. The Muslims will come and get us. Why? Because they've lost faith in freedom <coughs> and limited government. They've put their faith in Caesar and omnipotent government under the guise that it's freedom. See, the, the, I think we should not... We often talk about government public policy and economic regulations... But we shouldn't uh, perhaps totally ignore that this is reinforced by a cultural milieu. What is the attitude of the intellectuals, the professors, the second-handers in ideas, as the phrase goes? Uh, everywhere we see this, we say the, the market fails, uh, people can't re be reliant on themselves, uh, th there wouldn't be enough charity. Uh, the, the poor will always be with us in some imagery of starving children. Compare that to the cultural milieu of, let's say, the middle of the 19th century, when the regulations were falling, mercantilist controls were being abolished, uh, the, 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 the market was being set free, uh, individual initiative and entrepreneurship was undertaking the industrial revolution that began the process of raising humanity up from from starvation and despair. 
Now, what was the cultural environment of that? Well, I'm not sure how many viewers and listeners have ever heard the name Samuel Smiles. He was one of the most popular literary writers of the middle decades of the 19th century. In Great Britain, those books were published here in the U.S. too. He wrote books called Self-Help, Self-Responsibility, that sold in huge numbers for the right reading public of that time, being helping yourself, looking upon yourself to make decisions, planning for your own future, taking your own self-responsibility. And while it has often been caricaturized and ridiculed by later leftist intellectuals, there were in America in those mid and particularly late decades of the 19th century what were called the Horatio Alger uh, boy stories. Who was Horatio Alger? This kid who grew up in poverty, not really education. And the story always showed how determination, hard work, giving up the pleasures of the present for a possible gain in the future enabled even the, the humblest to rise to success and opportunity in a country like America. That was the cultural milieu. Did it mean that everyone became, in terms of financially, a Rockefeller or a Carnegie? No. But Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, came to the United States from Scotland with less than a full grammar school education and be founded and became the head of U.S. Steel. Henry Ford also came from humble beginnings and, 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 and uh, founded for Ford Motors. You can go through all of the list of these. People, nine times out of ten, came from humble beginnings. Uh, Kellogg, of Kellogg Cornflex, the, the, the Kellogg brother who came of Kellogg Cornflex was viewed as, 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 as the stupid ignoramus dullard of the family. And through a mistake, he invented Cornflex, which now, who, who hasn't heard of Cornflex in the world? And he made a big cereal company. All of these things are instances of not only examples, but a, a cultural and social and philosophical milieu of a society that understands, respects, values, and, and inculcates the, va the, the ideas of freedom and responsibility and, 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 and voluntary helping of others. Now, if I could go on with this, there was one other phrase that is not heard anymore. Did, did, were there people who needed a helping hand before the welfare state? Yes. And in the 19th century, there was an explosion of private charity and philanthropy. But there was a phrase that is never heard of anymore. The deserving poor. You try to give a person a helping hand with a little financial support. What does he do instead? He, but he spends the money on drink in the local saloon. You try to teach him a trade to be self-supporting in the marketplace. He just squanders it and doesn't show up. For, for, for the vocational training that, that, that your charity is trying to help him with. He's the undeserving poor. He's the person who you try to give a helping hand, and he's in his circumstances for no reason other than his own, because charity has tried to assist him. And you'd see, and, and the parent, it's almost a caricature, but the parent would, would take the child by the hand, and, and there'd be a drunk lying in the gutter, and the parent would say, you see, you see, if you don't stay in school and work hard, that will be you. That sounds harsh, but the point is, however harsh, you know, tough love, that is a lesson. Here is someone who probably was had hard times, maybe not of his own fault, but chances are, in that environment of laissez-faire charity, he probably was offered and was even given a helping hand, and he chose to p push the hand away. That's what can happen to you if you don't take responsibility for your own life. That, that's an important philosophy if a society is just saying it's, it's liberty and it's culture of freedom. And that's something that somehow has to be reawakened as well. Yeah, and the corollary to that is, is the opportunity that people have to, to make these choices. I mean, the classic example to me is, is young people and social security. I mean, let's face it, there's no fund. I mean, I know a lot of seniors have convinced themselves, oh, I put my money in, Jacob. It's there. It's in a lockbox in Fort Knox with my name on it. No. You're, you're, you were taxed. Your money was spent on things like the Iraq War, the Vietnam War, and the welfare for people that are now dead, including Social Security. All the money that has been taxed from people is gone over the years. So there's no fund. Um, well, so the money now is coming from young people. 
and middle-aged people that is being taken from them to give to seniors. Well, what's the implicit message in that? It's young people cannot be trusted to take care of their parents and their grandparents or their friends and neighbors that are getting into their senior years. They just can't be trusted, so we have to have this system that forces them to do this. Well, what you're really doing in that kind of system is you're denying young people and middle-aged people the opportunity to show that they can be trusted. I mean, and that's part of freedom. You got to trust freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't guarantee that every child is going to, when his parent really needs help, that he's going to reach out and help him out. But then that's where community groups come in and church groups and so forth. But you cannot deny people the opportunity to, to do these things. And to the extent that government seizes this massive amount of money from young people in, in the in the middle middle age, to that extent, those people are being denied that opportunity. Because remember, the Social Security Administration has a huge bureaucratic cost for performing this so-called service. I mean, huge salaries to, to bureaucrats, the administration costs, the bookkeeping costs. All that money could be sitting in the in the hands of young people and middle-aged people that would be available to help out the elderly, their parents, their grandparents, or their friends and neighbors in need in the community. So I think that's another aspect of this, is the destruction of the opportunity that people would have to, to reach out and help out others. But on that yeah. note, Richard, do you want to make well, a yeah. com comment? No, no. It's, well, I would just like to say something. I know what you're saying, that we've come to the end of our show. But uh, Jacob and I are taping at this uh, a few days before Christmas. So the end of the year is quickly approaching. And uh, I know that he probably was going to say something, but let me say it first. Uh, I've worked with the Future Freedom Foundation now for almost 30 years. And I've known Jacob Hornberger for even longer than that. And at this time of giving, if you believe in liberty, if you care about freedom, if you would like to have an outlet that fosters and cultivates the principal defense of human liberty, human dignity, and the free society, I cannot more strongly recommend and ask you, beseech you, to think of a contribution to this organization. What kind of outreach does it reach? Well, there is the Future Freedom monthly publication, which used to be Freedom Daily, for which I happily and and, 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 and privilege wrote for for many years. There are the books, both printed and online, that the Future Freedom Foundation has published now since virtually its beginning in the early 1990s. Uh, and to give one example of this, um, I had written a long series of articles in the Foundation's monthly publication uh, dealing with uh, monetary and central banking issues which uh, then FFF published just a few years ago as an ebook called Monetary Central Planning in the State. Uh, what kind of outreach does this reach? Well, obviously, and I can uh, happily say and modestly say, uh, for the first six months after it came out, it was among the top 10 in two of Amazon's ebook categories. But just recently, that book has been translated into Chinese, and I was informed today uh, in a, a Facebook notification that it has now been published in China by a reputable Chinese publishing house in Beijing and will be in stores to potentially a society that has a population of 1.3 billion people. Now, it would be a miracle if even one-tenth of one percent ended up reading it in China, but even that would be a lot of individual human beings. Now, it's not a matter of it being my book, but those are the kind of ideas that has been made possible to be reaching the public through the efforts of the Future Freedom Foundation. And I would call upon you, I would ask you, and I again would beseech you to think of this organization when it's time for your end of year giving. Uh, thank you, Richard. You know, Richard and I met many, many years ago in Dallas when I was practicing law and Richard was teaching at the University of Dallas. and. We immediately recognized, uh, this was back in the, the mid-80s, and we immediately recognized that we were on the same wavelength, uh, not only on this uncompromising uh, promotion and advancement of libertarian ideas, but also in the power of ideas. Uh, that, you know, okay, we, we are living in, a, in some dark times here in terms of government oppression and tyranny, uh, the, the welfare warfare state, uh, the, the, the lack of freedom, the destruction of freedom. Um, but one never knows what tomorrow can bring. 
You, you, you can't ever lose hope or faith, and that is what ideas on liberty can do. Now, they have to be sound ideas on liberty. You can't just put out some bad ideas and think, well, people will figure it out. No, you got to put the sound ideas, and that's why we've always presented this sound, uncompromising approach to, to libertarianism, because we believe not only is this the moral case for freedom, but it's the practical case. It works. Freedom really does work. And we can't do our work without those of you that help us out. Richard was with me here at FFF from the very beginning in 1989. And he was writing a monthly article for Freedom Daily, which has now become Future of Freedom. And we, we, we made it because there were those of you that helped us out with end-of-year donations. Your, your money that you send us now helps fund our activities for the coming year. And it, it funds things like this, the Libertarian Angle and Future of Freedom and the conferences and seminars and video presentations. Uh, so you help us get this message out there. And that's the only way things can shift. It's only through the power of ideas that's, that people's minds shift like they shifted with me and many other libertarians. And then all of a sudden it, it, something ignites that nobody can anticipate and it spreads like wildfire. And all of a sudden you see one of these massive societal shifts that take place periodically in history. So we would greatly appreciate your support. You've kept us going for 28 years now. And uh, we sure need your support for another year. So thank you very much for your consideration. Richard, thank you for your kind words, and thanks for the enjoyable show. I had a good time again with you. And let me just say to you and, of course, our viewers and listeners, a most Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we will see you again for more Libertarian Angle in 2019. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you all and Happy New Year. We're going to be skipping uh, Christmas week, and we'll be back to you after New Year's. Richard, Happy New Year, and Merry Christmas to you. And to you.